Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Can I please request the people sitting at the back to sit at the front so that you can have a better view of the presentations? Thank you. It is with great enthusiasm and honor that we welcome everyone on day two of the 13th International Neonatology Conference on Hottest Topics in Neonatal Medicine, 18th, 19th May, 2024 at Grand Hyatt Hotel in Abu Dhabi, UAE. I am Sumaya Abdul Karim and I'll be your host for the day. The field of neotology is widely recognized for its ongoing evolution fueled by groundbreaking research and technologies dedicated to improving the care and outcomes of our most valuable and vulnerable patients, newborns. We are assured that your ongoing engagement in the conference will prove to be a rewarding and enriching endeavor, offering valuable insights, motivation, and networking opportunities to support your professional and research endeavors. We anticipate that this two days gathering will leave a lasting impression and deliver significant impact. The conference is accredited by the European Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education for 13 European CME credit and Department of Health for 13, 15 CME hours. We would also like to thank our sponsors, International Hospital Institutions, lead sponsor, Bujil Medical City, gold sponsor, Children's Hospital for Philadelphia, Silver House sponsors, Casey, New Country Healthcare, Brown sponsor, Hessa Medical Equipment, Wyatt Nutrition, and exhibitors, Dew Farm, New Tech, Gulf Drug, Dragger, Wigan, Medwing, Medpro, ADIN, MDC, Care Medical Trading. And now, without a further ado, may we request on stage our conference chairman to give a warm welcome, Dr. Junaid Khan, Conference Chair, Director of Medical Education, Consultant Neotology, Shahbut Medical City, Abu Dhabi, and Adjacent Faculty of Khalifa University and Gulf Medical University, UAE. Please give him a round of applause. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Sumaya, and thank you all. You come again on Sunday morning. Those who come uh, uh, first time is welcome, and those who are coming again is uh, welcome again. Uh, I will not take that much time, uh, but I want to uh, summarize what happened yesterday. So yesterday we have a very robust session. First is the innovation in neonatology, especially the AI and the fetal medicine. So. Pretty soon, the uh, UAE, especially the Abu Dhabi Emirates, is going towards AI. Uh, you all heard the talk of Dr. Mariam uh, Habi, and uh, you, we are going in that direction, and pretty soon you will receive a message that you should be trained in AI. So this is the first thing. The second session, Still, I am getting the message. It's all about the controversies in many things. So uh, it's a very interactive session. People, you know, uh, still enjoying it and sending the messages uh, around. Uh, we got it into the many controversies, uh, feeding, the blood transfusion, the brain uh, protection and development, and uh, so on and so forth. Then the third session is about surgical. So those who are, uh, you know, holding the knives and uh, doing the minimal invasive surgeries and the different surgeries, uh, they will be uh, amazed by that session. And the last session is also, again, a very interactive one on the cardiology, uh, the PDA treat or not to treat, and uh, the new way to treat the PDA. So this is the, just a sum, uh, summary of that uh, yesterday. Again, today we have a very robust session. The first session we talk about our favorite. Uh, we cannot, you know, live without respiratory session. So this is going to be the respiratory one. Then we have a unique session about the quality. And uh, uh, we are doing the UAE perspective, uh, how to uh, decrease the neonatal mortality rate and other quality topics in that. And last but not the least, uh, because we um, 
receive a lot of feedback from audience that many questions remain unanswered. So we have a, some time just before closing that uh, if anybody asks any speaker of any questions in their mind. And with that we will, uh, inshallah, uh, close our conference for this year. So without further ado, uh, I will introduce, it's my pleasure um, uh, to introduce, uh, you all know him, Dr. Tasir Atrak. He is currently the chair of the department in the SSMC and he is a consultant neonatologist. Uh, he is a veteran uh, here and he did a lot of work for the DOH, recipient of Abu Dhabi Award from Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed. Uh, and he did a lot of work uh, for the DOH uh, in making the policies uh, there. So, Tessie, without further ado, welcome. Good morning. We have a great session. The respiratory session is really very important to all of us in the field. Um, so, uh, with no further ado, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Sarah DeMoro. Dr. DeMoro is the Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the University of Pennsylvania. She is also directing the neonatal follow-up program at CHOP. She will be talking to us today about uh, developmental follow-up of infant with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Please join me welcoming Dr. DeMoro. All right. Good morning. It's my pleasure to kick off the second day of this conference, and thank you again for the exciting opportunity. So this morning, we'll start by talking about what is known about the neurodevelopmental outcomes of children with BPD. I still have no conflicts of interest. So as we discussed yesterday, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or BPD, is far and away the most common morbidity of prematurity. The data on this slide, in the blue bar, are uh, we see data from 2015. In the red bars, we see updated data from 2022. All of these data from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network in the United States. And we see all of the common morbidities of prematurity among infants who survived long enough to be assessed for these outcomes and were born between 22 and 28 weeks. And we can see the good news that most morbidities are pretty uncommon and less common with time, and the bad news that BPD is more common with time and more common than all the other morbidities. As I showed you yesterday, the incidence of BPD is increasing over time. So given this, I think it's imperative that we stop and think about the longer-term outcomes of the infants who have this very common morbidity in all of our NICUs. So this morning we will talk about what do we know about the neurodevelopmental outcomes of infants with BPD. We'll talk about the common therapies that we use day in and day out to prevent or treat BPD and the influence of these treatments on these developmental outcomes. And then finally I'll touch on some of the next steps in our research program trying to understand the outcomes of children with BPD. So as far back as 2000, Maureen Hack and Betty Vore, the grandmothers of neonatal follow-up in the United States, described the developmental outcomes of children with BPD at about 20 months corrected age. They described that BPD was associated with increased risk for poor scores on the Bailey II, both the Mental Development Index and the Psychomotor Development Index, as well as functional outcomes, neurologic abnormalities, failure to walk independently, and failure to feed independently. Looking in more detail, we'll first examine cognitive development. So early childhood cognitive development is most commonly measured with the Bailey Scales of Infant and, Devel infant and Toddler Development 
This is not an IQ test, but rather an assessment of how quickly children are acquiring common developmental milestones. These data are from 1997, so they're old data, but still relevant today. We can see in the blue bars, infants with BPD. In the red bars, very low birth weight infants who did not have BPD. And in the green bars, term-born controls. As you can appreciate, as early as eight months, it's apparent that the infants with BPD are slower to acquire early developmental milestones in the cognitive domain. Even more importantly, perhaps, this does not get better with time, common misperception. We often think that these children will catch up with time, but as you can see, between eight months and three years, the differences persisted. Looking beyond early cognitive skill acquisition, we, have, we can evaluate school-age cognitive skills. By school age, we can measure intelligence or IQ, we can measure executive functions, and we can measure academic skills. This figure is a meta-analysis of studies that evaluated IQ at school age in very preterm children as compared to term-born controls. Each of the circles represents an individual study. And on the x-axis, you can see the percentage of BPD in the very preterm infants in each of the individual studies. And you'll appreciate that there is a strong relationship between IQ in the very preterm infants and the incidence of BPD in each of the individual studies, such that in studies with very low incidence of BPD, the very preterm infants had about a half a standard deviation lower IQ than the term-born infants. But as the incidence of BPD increased among the very preterm infants, it approaches more than one standard deviation difference in IQ. In this study, BPD, in fact, explained 65% of the variance in IQ in very preterm born children. And at the individual level, this means that BPD is associated with about a full standard deviation difference in IQ at school age. Looking beyond IQ, we can evaluate the, very, the various cognitive skills that are important for function in everyday life, including executive function and academic skills. These data are from the Elgan study, which may be familiar, the extremely low gestational age neonate study, again in the United States. And these authors looked at age 10 years, at these many, many components of cognitive skills, based on whether children were receiving ventilation and oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age, or just oxygen alone. And as you can see, the point estimates for those children who are on ventilation and oxygen fall much farther away from one, suggesting that this is a significant marker of cognitive delays at age 10 years. Looking in a little bit more detail, you can see that the adjusted odds ratio for poor verbal reasoning, nonverbal reasoning, listening comprehension, and oral expression, these are the components of IQ. The adjusted odds ratios are all about two times higher of having problems in these domains among children who had ventilation and oxygen at 36 weeks. Looking at executive functions, again, working memory, auditory attention, inhibition switching, this is the ability to hold information in your head and then use that information to make decisions or to think or to plan to prevent oneself from drawing attention to a distraction. These are the, these are the cognitive functions that are essential for children to really function well in school age and beyond. The odds ratios for having problems in these domains, again, two to four times higher among the children who had ventilation and oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age as compared to those who did not. And finally, this is where the rubber hits the road. We use our IQ and we use our executive function to learn. So ultimately, how did these children learn? Well, school function at 10 years, word reading, spelling, math. Odds of having problems in these domains were two to three times higher among the children who received ventilation and oxygen at 36 weeks postmenstrual age. So turning from cognitive development to motor development, this figure should look familiar. 
again from Lynn Singer's paper in 1997, just as cognitive developmental delay was present at eight months and persisted through three years, so too does motor developmental delay among children with BPD. Looking at later motor outcomes, the motor outcome that we all worry about most and certainly the motor outcome that we talk about with families most commonly is cerebral palsy. These data are from a meta-analysis that evaluated incidents of cerebral palsy in very preterm born children. And they decided to do this based on how BPD was defined. As you can see at the very bottom of this forest plot, the overall odds for having cerebral palsy among children with BPD was 2.1. So the two times higher odds of having cerebral palsy at school age among children who have BPD. Among the various definitions of BPD that were evaluated in this study, BPD in which the child was uh, receiving mechanical ventilation at 36 weeks postmenstrual age was the best predictor of this adverse outcome. However, cerebral palsy is not the only motor outcome that we should be worrying about. And in fact, motor coordination problems are far, far more common than cerebral palsy in our very preterm born children. This image is the handwriting of a first grader named Lucas who has a motor coordination problem. So you can appreciate it doesn't actually matter how smart Lucas is and whether he knows the answer if he can't communicate it and can't write it on a test. And so motor coordination problems have important impacts on the everyday functioning of our very preterm born children. And it turns out that BPD and exposure to postnatal dexamethasone which is a marker of severity of BPD, are the strongest predictors of problems with motor coordination at five years. Looking out to eight years, these are the scores of very preterm children with BPD in the first bar, very preterm children without BPD in the second bar, and term-born children on a test of motor coordination. And again, we can see that the children with BPD struggle far more than other children in this domain. Turning to behavior, we have learned using data from the NICHD Neonatal Research Network that infants with BPD are more likely to have withdrawn behaviors and pervasive developmental problems, and that these problems increase with higher grades of BPD. They are less likely to have sleep problems and aggressive behavior, However, the good news about this, at least, is that the differences in these domains are relatively small and may not be as clinically significant as some of the other problems that I've described. And then looking out to adolescents, these are the functional impacts of the problems I've been telling you about. Preterm children with BPD, these are French data. Uh, Preterm children with BPD are more likely to go to a school for children with special needs than preterm children without BPD or full-term controls, and they're far more likely to have needed to repeat a grade. We also think a lot about adaptive skills. How do children use all of these skills that I've been talking about in order to function in everyday life? And it was written more than a decade ago, and it still hasn't changed. Future research is needed that specifically examines how these impairments impact performance of activities of daily living at home and at school, and what supports these children need in order to function successfully in their daily lives. And this is one of the many things that we are trying to tackle in our research program today. So a few caveats about all of those studies I've just shared with you. You'll have noticed that most of these are small studies which suffer from selection and ascertainment bias. Many used outdated assessments. I gave you Bailey 2 data, Bailey 3 data. Now we use the Bailey 4. Or they report outcomes of babies who are different from the babies we see today. There were probably no 22 or 23 weekers in any of those studies. And they use different definitions of BPD. And so we are tackling many of these problems in different ways, but I will touch quickly on the issue of definitions. And Eric Jensen shared with you in detail last year 
the data-driven definition, severity-based definition of BPD that our team developed several years ago now, led by Eric. And I'd like just to just draw your attention again to the fact that this definition was based on uh, on two outcomes of importance, both late death or serious respiratory morbidity, but also late death or moderate to severe NDI. And the definition that we landed on was the most predictive of both of those outcomes. And this is something that I shared yesterday and that you've seen before. This severity-based definition of BPD, which separates BPD children into no BPD, grade one, grade two, and grade three, provides a graded relationship between severity of BPD and cognitive development at two years corrected age, such that with increasing severity of BPD, we see that children are more likely to have moderate or severe cognitive delay, and they are more likely to have severe delay. So both the incidence and severity of delay increase with increasing grade of BPD. Motor outcomes are similar. With increasing severity of BPD, we see increasing incidence of gross motor function classification levels two, three, four, and five, cerebral palsy, but also increased severity even among the children who have this adverse outcome. So to summarize this first section, BPD is independently associated with poor cognitive development, poor motor skills, poor learning, and executive function at least through adolescence. The grade of BPD is associated with both risk for impairment as well as the severity of impairment. And infants who remain intubated at 36 weeks postmenstrual age have a uniquely increased risk and are therefore deserving of our special attention. So turning to the common therapies that we use day in and day out to prevent or treat this disease, how do these how do these treatments influence the developmental outcomes? We often assume that because BPD is so closely associated with neurodevelopmental outcomes, that interventions that will reduce BPD therefore must inevitably also improve those outcomes. So is that in fact true? We could spend the entire day talking about all of the interventions that we have tried and tested in large randomized trials in order to prevent or treat BPD in our very preterm infants. I will not go through all of these today, but focus on just a few of them. So firstly, let's think about antenatal steroids. Antenatal corticosteroids are the, one of the best treatments we have to prevent lung disease. And we know with certainty that antenatal corticosteroids will prevent RDS and they will prevent moderate or severe RDS with a risk ratio of about 0.6. It's an excellent therapy. And you'll notice in the final column in this table, the number of infants who have contributed to these analyses in large meta-analyses in the Cochrane Review, upwards of nearly 8,000 infants have contributed to these data. Interestingly, the point estimates for neurodevelopmental delay, developmental delay, and cerebral palsy are quite similar to those for RDS. But if you look at the final column, you'll see that the numbers of infants in whom these outcomes have been assessed is far smaller, such that the risk ratios, while the point estimates are similar, the confidence intervals are broad and cross one, and so we don't have nearly the same level of certainty for the evidence for these outcomes. So while antenatal steroids probably do pre prevent neurodevelopmental delay, we can't say that for sure. And so I will come back to this again later, but I think this highlights the importance of following these infants, not only clinically, but in our randomized trials, in order to know for sure the impact of our outcomes, not only on the short term, but on the long term. Turning to postnatal steroids, if we had a week, we could talk through all of the different ways that postnatal steroids have been tested in our patients. But I will summarize by saying that we have used lots of different drugs at lots of different times with lots of different routes of administration. Most of these have not been demonstrated 
to certainly decrease BPD. And importantly, none of them have yet been demonstrated to improve neurodevelopment. And if used incorrectly, as highlighted in the first row, as an example, dexamethasone used early in the first postnatal week, while this does decrease BPD, it, does, it actually increases adverse neurode neurodevelopmental outcomes. We can turn to the classic therapies in our armamentarium. Surfactant absolutely reduces mortality. It absolutely reduces BPD. But the trial data tell us that surfactant does not improve neurodevelopment at two years. Vitamin A reduces BPD. But again, the trial data do not show us an impact on development at two years. Caffeine. Caffeine reduces BPD and improves a, cause, a composite outcome of death or neurodevelopmental impairment at two years. So caffeine is one of the best drugs we have to give to our patients. Not only does it improve the composite outcome of neurodevelopmental impairment, but it improves cognitive development as well as motor development. And then remarkably, the patients enrolled in the large caffeine for apnea of prematurity trial were followed through five years where the composite outcome of death or developmental impairment was no longer significant, but there was a persistent signal for improved motor outcome. And in fact, when these children were followed even through school age, 11 years, that signal for improved motor outcome continued, making this far and away the most neuroprotective drug that we have. Looking at respiratory therapies, very briefly, CPAP versus intubation in the delivery room. Many of us have been trying hard not to intubate babies if we can avoid it. This does decrease BPD with a number needed to treat of about 25 without an impact on development. First intention high frequency therapy does not decrease BPD, but there is some suggestion of perhaps better lung function and academic skills in adolescence, which certainly deserves further exploration. What about oxygen? So maybe oxygen is a drug, maybe it's a respiratory therapy, maybe it's both. We've talked a lot in the past day about the Neoprom trials, five large randomized trials around the world to compare lower versus higher oxygen saturation targeting for extremely preterm infants. Infants enrolled in these trials uh, helped us understand that lower oxygen saturation target ranges are associated with lower chances of being on oxygen at 36 weeks and less treatment with, for ROP, higher ranges associated with lower mortality and less severe neck. But ultimately, there was no difference in neurodevelopment at two years. What about use of oxygen after discharge? Our colleagues in pediatric pulmonary medicine will tell us that oxygen is increasingly viewed by their group of providers as a safe and relatively means for, uh, convenient means for maximizing growth and development. So the pulmonologists put kids on oxygen because they think it will be good for their development. We asked whether this is in fact true using data from the Neonatal Research Network. We performed a propensity matched cohort study in which we matched 1,000 infants who were discharged breathing in supplemental oxygen to another 1,000 infants who were discharged breathing in room air. And we looked at their outcomes at about two years corrected age. We found that, in fact, there is no difference in development between infants discharged to breathing in oxygen and those discharged breathing in room air. And these data are the Bailey 3, cognitive language and motor, whether you use a moderate cutoff or a more severe cutoff, results were the same. Looking at rates of cerebral palsy, moderate or severe cerebral palsy and behavior problems, again, oxygen did not protect development in these children. So in summary, interventions to reduce BPD do not all lead to improved development and again, I will remind you that if we do not continue to follow these children, we won't know the outcomes of our therapies. So what are a few of the next steps in research about outcomes of children with BPD? 
We have many active studies exploring different um, perspectives and different aspects of this problem, but I will just focus on two of them since these are the two that will hopefully be coming to a journal near you sooner rather than later. Our unit in our chronic lung disease program at CHOP recently instituted a program of early progressive mobility for our infants who are intubated with severe lung disease. This is a really exciting partnership between our nursing staff, our respiratory therapists, and most importantly, our physical and occupational therapists, in which we mobilize our intubated infants as soon as they will tolerate it. First, skin to skin and out of the bed, they get therapy on the crib surface, but also off. We put them in swings and chairs. We get them in all sorts of seating devices. We lay them prone. We do whatever we can to get them up out of the bed and moving around. After rolling out a unit-wide education and a new policy about early progressive mobility, we were able to demonstrate that this is both safe and feasible in infants with BPD. As you can see, blue bars, the how frequently infants were placed in different positions before, red bars after institution of this policy, infants were more likely to be set prone, sitting up, put in a chair, and held skin to skin. And they were less likely to be tilted in the bed by the nursing staff. We studied the effect of this intervention on motor skill acquisition in our children with BPD. We used the test of infant motor performance, which assesses um, both uh, elicited items, so you sort of play with the child and watch how they respond, as well as observed items, observing how the child moves in space. And we assessed the TIMP uh, at two time points about eight weeks apart in a gr group of children before we implemented this policy and then another group of children after we implemented this policy. And you can see that before we implemented this policy, over an average of about eight weeks, children acquired about 1.5 more points on the TIMP. So they were acquiring skills, but slowly. After implementation of this policy, we had a significant improvement such that infants were acquiring about four more points on the TIMP over eight weeks. So they were, they were increasing the rate at which they acquired new motor developmental skills. So this is a fun new way to manage kids with BPD. It's scary for many people, um, but it's certainly something that we have demonstrated to be safe um, and feasible, and something that we will be rolling out to other institutions in the future. And then lastly, we are working hard to better understand and characterize the functional outcomes of high-risk infants. We are just, just finishing school-age follow-up of Christy Waterberg's hydrocortisone for BPD trial, with which I'm sure many of you are familiar. In the hybrid outcome study, we are following these children at five to seven years. We are evaluating motor function, cognitive function, respiratory function, and ultimately, the two aims of this study are to evaluate the impact of hydrocortisone on functional impairment rates at school age, and also to better characterize the relationships between severity of BPD and these outcomes. We're also measuring respiratory function in several hundred children, so we'll also be able to better understand longer-term respiratory impacts of severe lung disease in preterm children. So to wrap up, BPD is associated with poor developmental outcomes throughout childhood. Infants who are, BP, are intubated at 36 weeks have significantly increased risk for poor development. Our strategies to prevent and treat BPD have not consistently improved these outcomes. And continued research is essential for identifying targeted therapies to improve these outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeMauro, for this uh, great update. Our next speaker will be Dr. Uh, Seridar uh, 
Kaila uh, Sandaram. He'll be speaking to us today about uh, supportive care in the ventilated patient. Uh, Dr. Seridar is a consultant and neonatologist with Med Clinic in Al Ain. Please join me welcoming Dr. Seridar. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Ayman and Dr. Junaid for giving me this opportunity. And thank you all for being present on a nice Sunday morning. Uh, there are different aspects. I mean, I really enjoy being part of uh, Dr. Junaid and Dr. Ayman's conference for many reasons. And almost the 13th year, and I've been fortunate enough to attend from the second one onwards because I moved to UAE at that time. But <laughs> It's amazing, and thank you. Keep up the good work. You should publish a book on your experience on this as well. Thank you. Uh, this topic is obviously not going to give you much of new knowledge, but just as the quality symposium in the afternoon, which is again a unique concept which all of you should try to attend, the idea is not just to learn new things. It's about thinking about what you do already. Think about a new perspective to it. Think about where you can improve. Think about whether there is any aspect you would like to change. So, supportive care obviously comes a lot from the nursing side. Neonatology is teamwork and everyone here would agree that without our nurses, neonatology won't be a really successful field. And many thanks to the wonderful nursing staff we have. Obviously, it's a partnership. So, it's not just the nurses who do uh, care of the babies. We need to be partners and the physician should know as much of the nursing jobs and the nurses should know as much of the physician's job as possible so that the partnerships works even better. And that's one of the focus on the current NRP guidelines that they try to merge the team working better. So the role difference is merged in. Always look at supporting your nurses, empowering them. Uh, just a quick word about my YouTube channel. I'll be sharing this lecture as well and some of you may be familiar. I would request you to go through this and uh, many aspects of what we are discussing today will be covered in detail on the channel as well. So, uh, we all understand that ventilatory support is needed in the sickest of babies and we try more and more to move away from invasive ventilation to non-invasive ventilation. Carrying the baby on non-invasive ventilation who is very small or very sick is much more challenging than managing a baby on intubation. Uh, so, it's uh, the nurse's testament that they manage the tiniest small babies with non-invasive ventilation. We know about ventilation and the support of ventilation. We know settings, modes. We know volume guarantee, high frequency and everything, but supportive care is anything else that is associated with the care of a sick ventilated baby. And uh, good supportive care is key to a good outcome. We just uh, heard from Dr. Sarah the impact of BPD on long term and part of the impact can be improved. She started describing early intervention. Uh, I know we are all looking at developmental care and early intervention, so all that starts as well. And these impact not only the short term outcome, the long-term outcome is impacted as well. And of course, the parents, they are involved in this. And when we see good supportive care all around, obviously, uh, the parents are parts of the, part of the team as well. Uh, I already mentioned this, so we owe a lot to our uh, dedicated nursing staff. And adequate staffing and occupancy is key. I mean, all of you are managers in your team, and you know how difficult it is for managing your nursing staff or the, even the physician staffing to maintain. So bed occupancy is a time which always hits you if it's fully occupied or you're overburdened a unit like Tawam or Cornish or Latifa, you know that you're always overfull. And these are the uh, units which face problems because the nurses are dragged upon different areas, the doctors are called upon to attend different things. So uh, staffing is key to have a good outcome as well. So. First, I will start with the NICU characteristics and we have uh, examples. For example, the new Cornish hospital model that's being built is an individual room, which is a dream for most of you. I hope uh, we get that fairly soon and I think Dr. Ayman has a similar vision for the Tawam unit, a few rooms uh, of this model. So that will be an interesting thing. So we need the space, we need the equipment and we need the supporting services. And when we have an individual room, it has challenges as well because if you're already pressed for nursing staff, um, the parents will be in the room, but you cannot guarantee that they will be responsible for the baby. The staff still has a full accountability. So your nursing numbers need to go up where you're offering that. And of course, in a good 
team, we discussed already that the nursing and the physician team are partners, so we should be working together. The physician team obviously includes experienced members who will guide the junior team, but in a supportive way so that the junior team doesn't hesitate to come back to you uh, for doubts. And again, motivation is important. You should praise the good performance of anyone in the team. The nursing team, there is no need to talk about commitment and dedication because once you become a nurse, I think it comes automatically to you. And uh, safety-centric approach and quality-centric approach, again, I stressed the session in the afternoon. Please join for that session as well because quality is key. And quality is just one way to make sure you do things right. You know what to do, but whether you're really doing it as you should. And uh, debriefing after incident should be built into your team approach as well. So any incident happens, don't be having a carrot and stick approach. Try to learn from it, try to see how you can avoid such incidents in the future as well. So in terms of monitoring, so any sick baby needs monitoring and when the baby is on ventilation, obviously we depend a lot on the feedback we get from the monitors. We have pulse oximetry, transcutaneous oxygen and carbon dioxide monitoring. And of course the PCO2 is monitored on the entitled uh, continuous monitoring as well. Many of you may have the new transcutaneous oxygen carbon dioxide monitors and it's quite helpful. But unfortunately we have limitation on how many babies you can use. It still needs you to rotate the site and though the risk of burns has been reduced in the newer equipment, we still need to keep an eye on that. Regarding central lines, I mean, you should have a unit-specific guideline, try to limit its use to as uh, minimal period as you can. The timing of blood gas, more, most of you may be moving away from a protocol-based approach where I say four hourly or six hourly gas. Try to move away from that, try to do the gas as it is clinically indicated. And once the baby is stable on non invasive ventilation, you can actually use alternative ways to monitor the baby and have the blood gas to uh, uh, support your management like electrolyte management, bilirubin management, so you're clubbing everything together so uh, minimizing intervention is key, minimizing sampling is key, so think about how you do it, even if you have a central line, by reducing the number of times you handle the central line, the risk of infection through that is going to reduce. So uh, vital signs of course is part of the, and most of us have continuous charts, we have uh, beds uh, connected together in the NICU so you can monitor them centrally. So heart rate, respiratory rate, the effort and pattern of breathing is also mentioned by the nurses in the chart. And temperature in the ventilated babies, the core peripheral difference becomes important because it gives you an indication of perfusion. Also in the newer Massimo monitors or similar ones, you also have the perfusion index which you can teach your staff to recognize. So this is just to show you the uh, transcutaneous as well as the pulse oximeter. Uh, we had an excellent session during the workshop uh, by Dr. Helmet and uh, obviously it was a very useful session on uh, air leak management and one of the interesting points that came out is the increasing incidence of air leaks as we go more and more for non-invasive ventilation. So we had a similar experience, some of my colleagues from Danath are here, so when we try to do non-invasive ventilation aggressively, you need to think carefully about uh, the timing of surfactant. So you can do LISA, you can do Insure, whatever suits you, but do it in a timely fashion. If you go very high on non-invasive pressures, um, I think Dr. Junaid had a very nice lecture of that, of the SSMC experience as well as to timing of surfactant. Don't delay the surfactant if the baby needs it and that might help you reduce the risk of air leaks. Of course, be prepared to manage such critical emergencies. For example, having a cold light accessible, Everyone who is new to your unit should be shown all these critical equipment and they should be encouraged to uh, learn and spread the information as well. So just train, make sure the stock is adequate, especially in the smaller units. Uh, teach your staff appropriately how to needle because it's an emergency procedure. They are supposed to know, but you can't assume they know. So make sure you have skill drills which cover these aspects as well. Uh, intubation and emergency airway equipment, the best units have them organized ready, even the pre-medication are kept uh, pre-prepared. But if you are not going to have it, keep it accessible, make sure everything is there uh, without having to run around. Because it's an emergency, you need to be really prepared for those things. So this is, for example, the pigtail catheter. I don't know, most of you might be changing over to the pigtail, but uh, Helmut said he prefers the routine ones. Of course, it's left to your individual and of course the underwater drainage, the hemlick valve and these things are also important. 
So we also need a good response from the radiology team. Those in bigger hospitals even struggle because the same uh, on-call person may be covering the emergency, they may be covering the labor room and they'll cover the NICU as well. So we need to have a code which will clearly say it's an emergency. For example, if it's an air leak, most of us don't drain just on the uh, cold light unless it's a tension pneumothorax like situation. So we wait for the X-ray but try to make sure the team understands the emergency of it so they drop what they're doing and come to you. Um, POCUS is developing as well. Most of you are getting versed, well versed with use of lung ultrasound for diagnosing pneumothorax, for example, or for guiding your uh, inotrope management. So the appropriate use of ultrasound, how you document it, because most of us are not privileged to report, but I'm sure you can document that you're using it as a guide to your treatment. Uh, preparedness to manage PPHN, for example, if you anticipate nitric oxide needs time to set up, so if you expect that the baby may need nitric oxide, prepare it and keep it ready so that you don't waste time when you actually decide to use it. And of course, transport. If you are in a smaller unit which needs to take the unit, you need to effectively transport the baby and be ready with that as well. And train your team on how to monitor during the transport and so on. Uh, we should never forget nutrition as a very important component of supportive care. Uh, in fact, the BPD outcomes are much better the long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes are much better, infection rate is lower, where your team focuses on nutrition from the start and achieves a very good support. So starting very early with trophic feeds is very important, having a good system to support the mother to bring express milk. Unfortunately, in many mothers, milk takes two, three days to come and you may decide to start some formula, but never give up the support for breastfeeding. Antenatal expression is a consideration in the bigger babies if your unit will support it, that is six weeks and above, but in a preterm pre setup, that may not be applicable. Donor milk is not as much, uh, I mean, established in this part of the world for religious reasons, and uh, we need to look at alternative aspects as well. Don't hold the feeds for minor uh, aspirates. Move away from checking aspirates routinely. So these are things which will help you reach full feed sooner. Have a standardized approach to progressing with feeds. Many studies have shown that having a guideline-based standardized approach, which is not slow, is going to help you come off the central line faster, reduce the rate of infections and NEC as well. And TPN and central axis makes you give the optimal nutrition source without the risk of extravasation injury. So don't hesitate to use central lines where it is indicated. At the same time, remove them at the earliest possible. And uh, I mean, don't insert it in a bigger baby who can progress to full feeds. In fact, stable babies more than 32 to 33 weeks, you may not need central lines for, and uh, even TPN may not be needed in these babies. Uh, PDA management is a controversial topic and of course, I mean, we would love to hear, uh, we had the lectures yesterday evening as well and individual approaches are different, but it's a critical aspect of supportive care in the ventilated and sick neonates. In the extreme premature babies, I believe there is a role in the 25 weeks and below especially. 27 and 28 weaker with the PDA may not need treatment, but the ones smaller than that, if you do a targeted approach and using paracetamol as a first choice because it seems to be safer, and Brufen, if not uh, responding well. Of course, we had the recent studies, the Baby Oscar study and uh, the Benedictus study, but they use Brufen more, and the paracetamol is being studied. We should have the results in a couple of years. Uh, inotropes and fluid management should be guided by echo findings, and this would make us more confident. Don't uh, use inotropes blindly because they're not totally safe drugs either, and uh, it's very important that we monitor and wean the drugs as possible. So this is uh, POCUS with uh, bedside ultrasound, diagnosis of a patent ductus arteriosus. Uh, don't uh, diagnose it just by seeing it. You need to uh, check the hemodynamic significance. There are certain uh, tools. Uh, the IOVA approach is quite useful for that. And infection control, I mean, there is no, uh, no word that will be enough to say the importance of infection control. and infection prevention in the unit. So obviously, hand, hand, hand hygiene is going to be the key. Never forget that. This is a list of uh, important medications or interventions, and some of these were covered uh, by Dr. Sarah in the earlier lecture. So antenatal steroids, very important. Don't forget delayed cot lamping, because the hemodynamic significance of delayed cot lamping is going to be very important. 10 minutes. Oh, right, okay, sorry. From which stage? Sorry about that. 
I'll just continue talking. I mean, obviously, uh, delayed cot lamping, most of you may be familiar with that. Uh, don't miss out on delayed cot lamping uh, for the premature babies as well. Of course, there are uh, monochorionic twins where you may not want to do it. Antipartum hemorrhage is a contraindication as well. So, unless there is a contraindication, try to uh, encourage your team. In a premature baby, it matters much more, partly because their blood volume is limited. They don't get the immune factors from the mother as much. So, what comes through from the mother to the baby, uh, the blood that is having the immunoglobulins don't miss out on that. Hemodynamic instability is much more common in the smaller babies as well. Uh, NRP guided team approach to resuscitation, all of you use labor room CPAP and there is now evidence to show that the uh, high flow during intubation may be useful. Use of laryngeal mask airway during intubation can be considered as well as a supportive management. And golden hour approach, I mean all of you are familiar with doing things in a timely fashion but uh, in a safe way as well. IVH prevention bundle, I would encourage all of you to look at that for the babies below 28 weeks. Focus on the infant position, neck position, not to turn the neck to the side. Delayed clamping is important as well. And careful approach to ventilation, not to overdo ventilation. Timely use of surfactant, appropriate suction as well. And surfactant therapy in a timely fashion, I already uh, mentioned that. Don't delay the surfactant therapy. And caffeine therapy should be done in a timely fashion as well. So this is a debatable topic as well. Would you consider caffeine on the day one in a 24-weeker whom you may not extubate for a week to 10 days? There is no harm in giving it, but don't think it's a golden hour management in such babies. But in the babies where you're trying to do non-invasive ventilation from day one, caffeine becomes important from early on. So in a 27, 28 weeker, it becomes important right from the golden hour where you want to keep the baby on NAPPV successfully. But in a bigger, smaller premature baby, you can stabilize the baby and give the caffeine the first couple of days. If you don't give as well, it doesn't matter. Dr. Barbara Schmidt, who is the main author of the CAP study, clearly stresses that caffeine is not a neuroprotective drug. Its neuroprotection is from the respiratory protective effect. So when you extubate the baby and when the babies are non-invasive is when you need the caffeine most. Postnatal steroids, we discussed already in Dr. Sarah's talk. And a prompt identification and treatment of infections. Of course, prevention is key. But if there is infection, you need to identify and treat it as well. Uh, there are some images in this, but I mean, you won't be able to see that because of the stage issue. ET tube fixation is very important. Look at what tools you use to fix it and don't, uh, uh, don't think about um, a self-extubation as a minor issue because re-intubation is a major thing in a small baby and do your best to try and secure it well. If any issues are identified, for example, some babies self-extubate inside the mouth, uh, you have to uh, fix it in a way that self-extubation doesn't happen. And the nursing team should document the level it's fixed. Sometimes the doctor sees the x-ray, adjusts the tube position, but it is not documented. So be careful that this is uh, important, I mean, done well. And the importance of the neck position in the ET tube position is important. If the neck is flexed, the tube goes in more. So obviously, if the tube is borderline deep, make sure the neck is kept extended if you decide not to pull the tube back. In a small baby, for example, even 0 0.3, 0 0.4 millimeter makes a big difference. So you may decide not to pull it, but leave a note to keep the neck slightly extended so it doesn't flex. Uh, humidification is another important part of the supportive care in a ventilated baby. And of course, uh, the cold gas comes through the central uh, gas supply. It has only 2% humidity and it is very cold. Obviously, never give cold gas directly to the baby. In the small babies, we all have facility to give high flow. So it's humidified, heated gas. So even if you think the baby doesn't need a higher pressure, start with the high flow from the start. And uh, humidified high flow like uh, Fisher Packer or Vapotherm ensures adequate humidification in any baby who needs more than two liters uh, per minute flow. And in any baby who needs respiratory support, obviously it's an evolving picture. A baby may appear stable in the beginning, but you're trying to uh, monitor the baby and increase the support. So start with high flow, even if it is two to three liters and increase as needed. So this gives heated humidified gas. Unfortunately, you can't see the chart on uh, how the relative humidity increases as the temperature increases. So the absolute water vapor content is going to increase. If uh, the screen comes back, I'll go back to the slide to show you. But obviously, uh, the heating to 39, brings it up to 44 uh, milligrams in the water vapor content. And as the temperature uh, drops when the baby reaches, the same water vapor content is maintained. One important tip about the heated humidified circuit, the 
heater wire, the probe should be outside the incubator. So make sure that the probe is outside the incubator to reduce condensation because the distal part, if it is inside the incubator, it's going to read the temperature. So the amount to which it heats drops. So then the condensation starts increasing. So make sure the circuit is uh, long enough from the part the heater wire uh, reaches the uh, incubator to reach the baby inside. So the airway humidification is a crucial aspect. So never forget to switch on the humidifier. Sometimes the nurses forget to switch on the humidifier when they're setting up the machine. The baby starts getting CPAP, then someone notices it's not on. So never start. Have that as your first step in setting up the CPAP or non-invasive ventilation. And uh, have a way to check the water content regularly if it doesn't alarm. Avoid using any form of respiratory support with, without the humidified gases in the premature babies. Uh, in terms of suction, obviously all of us agree that suction should not be routine. The suction is important to clear the airway from secretions because the blocked airway, either the nose or the ET tube isn't going to deliver the pressure that the baby needs. Uh, use the minimum uh, required pressure and use only when indicated and not on a time basis, but show your nurses how to look at the waveforms, how to uh, improve the system so that uh, they can decide in an objective way. Nasal patency is a very important issue in babies on non-invasive and traumatic suction is one of the reasons why we get obstruction of the nares. So make sure that from the beginning we look after these babies gently, use suction only needed, saline installation, humidification, appropriate sized nasal interface, all these will avoid the nasal uh, trauma. We have seen a very uh, a number of tiny babies where we have uh, nasal trauma and that makes it more difficult. Yes. <laughs> So I'll just go back to this, I mean, this is the heater wire part. So all of you might be familiar with the probe, the distal probe should be outside the incubator. So that's the point. And uh, this is the chart I was mentioning about, uh, all of you may be uh, able to get that in uh, ventilation textbooks. So it's a relationship between absolute humidity, relative humidity and the temperature of the gas. So uh, a gas accommodating 44 milligrams at 37 degrees with 100% relative humidity and uh, obviously you need to reach this water vapor content so that it doesn't uh, affect. The humidifiers have been modified in the past 10 years or so to avoid overheating because when you heat it at the humidifier level to a higher level, it can take more water vapor, it can cause steam burns in the airway. So that has been corrected already, so you don't need to worry about that part. So the last part is about chest physiotherapy. I mean, most of you may have respiratory therapists in your unit and the nurses are also trained, but routine chest physiotherapy is not advocated in the small premature babies because you will be handling them. So there are certain indications like evidence of retained pulmonary secretions, weak or ineffective cough, a focal lung opacity on chest X-ray, which is suggesting atelectasis. So these are the situations. And again, as we discussed, uh, Dr. Helmut's presentation on pneumothorax, he suggested putting the pneumothorax side down, which may reduce the leak. And in the case of atelectasis, you want to keep the atelectasis side up. So you're trying to ventilate better. So positioning is important as well. So postural drainage in concert with percussion or vibration may help you in removing secretions and preventing atelectasis. And the re regular positioning helps periodic redistribution in the gravity dependent regions of the lung. There are systematic reviews which didn't show significant benefit of using chest physiotherapy in any of the measures that we look at. Uh, the side effects may include reflux if the baby is being fed. The baby may not tolerate it well, they become tachypneic or tachycardic. And if you do it too strongly, even rib fractures have been reported. And of course, in the ELBW babies, we talked of the IVH prevention bundle, so you may have to take care of uh, handling in the early stages for these babies. Uh, I'm sorry about the technical difficulty. I hope uh, I still managed to convey some of the information I wanted to convey. Respiratory support is only one aspect of the intensive care needed in a sick neonate. Many aspects of supportive care impact on the overall condition of the baby as well as the long-term outcome. As I mentioned in the beginning, a regular review of your unit practices for looking at which aspect of these needs to change. Never be rigid in your approach. Always think that there is room for change because you can easily modify what you're doing. And we need to invest in quality improvement initiatives to improve these as well. So I still have two minutes. I finished in time, but if you want to go back on any of the slides, I don't know if I can show you some of the images, but uh, 
I think this is the 82 fixation device as I was mentioning, but apart from that, I don't think you miss much. Again, I'll share this on my YouTube channel, so I hope you will get a fuller picture there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saridar, for this uh, great review. Uh, I would like to ask again uh, Dr. DeMauro to the stage to speak to us about oxygen targeting in babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Dr. DeMauro? <clears throat> All right. One last time you get to hear from me. Um, thank you. This will be a little bit different from my other two talks. I will share the results of a randomized trial that is soon to be published. Um, I do not have any conflict of interest. This kiddo was in my trial. All the photos I will show you are kids who are in my trial. The parents gladly shared these photos um, for your enjoyment. So supplemental oxygen in preterm infants. So. Supplemental oxygen was first administered to preterm infants as far back as the 1940s when it was observed that survival increased when oxygen was provided to preterm babies. Unfortunately, by 1950, retinopathy of prematurity became the leading cause of blindness worldwide. And in 1956, unrestricted oxygen exposure was identified as the primary cause of this blindness. And since 1956, our field has been on a journey to try to understand the best way to use this life-saving, but also very, very dangerous medication in our extremely preterm infants. What have we learned? Well, as I shared with you and also as Helma shared yesterday, we have learned from the NEOPROM trials a considerable amount about early oxygen management in extremely preterm infants. We have learned that high as compared to low oxygen saturation targeting early in life does not impact the risk for death or neurodevelopmental impairment at two years corrected age. We have learned that using a saturation target of 91 to 95, that's the high range in those trials, is associated with lower mortality and lower rates of severe neck. And we have learned that the lower target, which is in the high 80s, is associated with lower rates of BPD and severe retinopathy. Furthermore, detailed analyses of data from the COT, or Canadian Oxygen Trial, have taught us that the risks for late death or, co or disability, cognitive or language delay, and motor impairment increase with the proportion of time that infants spent with a saturation less than 80%. So as you can see in the figure, as the percent of time in, with 80 per, saturations below 80% increases, there is a significant incre, uh, increase in the probability of late death or disability. Further analyses have shown us that these associations become stronger with postnatal age, such that the risk of death or disability associated with hypoxemia is far more significant at nine to 10 weeks postnatal age than it is at earlier time points. This figure is for late death or disability, but as you can appreciate, it looks quite similar to the figures for cognitive or language delay and motor impairment, where the outcomes are much more strongly associated with hypoxemia that occurs at nine to 10 weeks postnatal age as compared to one to two weeks postnatal age. However, in the Canadian Oxygen Trial, and actually in all of the NEOPROM trials, there was no monitoring beyond 36 weeks postmenstrual age. So we don't know if these associations persist beyond that time point. What do we know about hypoxemia beyond 36 weeks postmenstrual age in healthy preterm infants? These data are from the CHIME study, the open circles are preterm infants, the closed circles full-term infants, the y-axis is, is the proportion of inter infants with intermittent hypoxemia, and the x-axis postmenstrual age in weeks. And as you can appreciate, a significant proportion of preterm infants 
healthy preterm infants have hypoxemia at 36 and 38 weeks postmenstrual age. In fact, the rate of hypoxemia does not approach that of full-term infants until somewhere between 44 and 46 weeks postmenstrual age. These are data from Larry Ryan in Boston, again looking at late hypoxemia, so about 35 to 40 weeks postmenstrual age. Again, healthy preterm infants breathing in room air. And you can see the seconds per hour that these infants spend with hypoxemia, saturations below 90% in the blue bars, 85% in the pink, and 80% in the green bars. And as you can see, while it does improve over time, even through 39 weeks postmenstrual age, preterm infants breathing in room air continue to have desaturations below 90% and even below 80% every hour. So those are healthy children. What do we know about our children with BPD? As I've reminded you over and over again, half of our surviving extremely preterm infants have BPD. And it has long-term impacts on mortality, development, lung function, and even healthcare costs. We know that early hypoxemia below 80% is associated with an increased risk of severe BPD. We know that hypoxemia, again, early in life, below 90% predicts a poor respiratory outcome. But once infants have BPD, what do we know about hypoxemia in those infants? How should we manage it? What are the strategies? So our research team identified the following knowledge gaps. We actually don't know the frequency or severity of hypoxemia over time in infants with established BPD. We don't know whether intermittent hypoxemia persists after they are weaned off of supplemental oxygen. We know a lot about oxygen saturation targeting early in life for extremely preterm infants, but we don't know whether targeting different ranges affects the incidence of intermittent hypoxemia or the overall burden of hypoxemia once BPD is established. And we don't know how oxygen management in these infants affects their clinical outcomes, and particularly, of interest to me, of course, is their neurodevelopment. So with these questions in mind, we developed the BPD STAR, or BPD Saturation Targeting Trial. I will tell you that these results of this trial are currently under review, so I would ask you not to share these data too widely, please. So this is our study question. In infants with established BPD, does a higher oxygen saturation target range here greater than or equal to 96%? as compared to a lower range, 90 to 94%, decrease the incidence of intermittent hypoxemia and total time with hypoxemia between 36 weeks postmenstrual age and six months corrected age. So to answer that question, we performed a randomized trial. We included infants who were before 30 weeks gestation at the time of birth and who were between 34 and 44 weeks postmenstrual age at the time that we enrolled them. All of these infants had moderate or severe BPD and had never been discharged from the hospital. Our primary outcomes were the incidence of intermittent hypoxemia. We define this as less than 80% for at least 30 seconds. You'll notice this is slightly different from some of the definitions that have been used before, and I'm happy to talk about why at another time if of interest. We also evaluated the proportion of time with hypoxemia our primary threshold was 80%. Secondarily, we used a more conservative threshold of 90%. We evaluated different durations of hypoxemia. And then we evaluated clinical outcomes, growth, medical history, health utilization, feeding, and health-related quality of life through three and then six months corrected age, and evaluated development at six months corrected age. We assumed that it would be difficult to get data for these kids, so we planned to enroll up to 50 infants in order to make sure that we had at least 42 with enough data for our oximetry analyses. This was expected to give us 80% power. And we stratified our randomization by gestational age and by severity of BPD. 
We performed standard comparisons between our groups, and we use a Wilcoxon sign rank test to compare numbers of events over the study period and the proportion of time with hypoxemia. So how did we do this? This was a fun trial to set up. We used the Massimo RAD8 oximeter because that device in particular was cleared by the FDA in the United States for use in infants. It was really important to us that we use an FDA-approved device. We attached it to a Raspberry Pi, which is basically a teeny tiny computer, and then attached that to a Wi-Fi device. And this allowed us to get continuous streaming data from our study participants no matter where they were. We put the study probe on them while they were in the hospital. In the hospital, as this young man is trying to show you, they wore two, both their clinical oximeter probe and the research oximeter probe. And then once they were discharged from the hospital, they continued to wear the research oximeter. And then the oximeter, because it was attached to a Wi-Fi device, it streamed data back to us at Penn continuously. The engineers at Penn developed this great dashboard for us where we could monitor our participants' oxygen saturations real time. They've published the data flow for this. It was very important to us that this all be open source, so any of this equipment can be purchased on the open market. The programming for how the data flowed back to us is all published online and available open source, so anybody can do this. It's a closer look at our dashboard. So each week, our study team reviewed all of the oximetry data for our active study participants. We summarized the weekly data. We then reviewed the weekly data with the clinicians and then made decisions about titration of respiratory support according to an algorithm that had been developed for the study. We followed these infants until three months and then six months corrected age. This is our study flow diagram of 253 participants, or potential participants who we approached. 50 were consented and randomized. Fewer than I had hoped, but this was the impact of COVID on our trial. 22 were randomized to the high saturation target group and 28 to the low saturation target group. A few in each group did not have enough data for oximetry analyses, but all were included in our clinical outcome analysis. These are the baseline characteristics of our trial participants. You can see on average, they were small babies. They were on average 25 or 26 weeks gestation at birth and about 700 to 800 grams at the time they were born. As is common in BPD, the majority were male. Representative of our local patients, at our hospital, the majority were black or African-American, a quarter white. About 10% of the moms were Hispanic. And most moms had about a high school education. This is the level of respiratory support of our study participants at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. So you can see most of these infants were not invasively ventilated at 36 weeks post-menstrual age. Our study protocol did not start until infants were extubated. So the vast majority of these infants would be classified as having grade one or grade two BPD. And they were on average just right about at term corrected age at the time that we enrolled them. As we followed these if infants, on average, they were weaned to, to, um, to room air at about a postmenstrual age of 52 to 53 weeks. So we observed these infants on average about three, weeks on three months on oxygen, about three months off. They finished their study monitoring at about 61 to 63 weeks postmenstrual age. And we had about 600 to 1,000 hours worth of monitoring data in our participants. These are the achieved oxygen saturations in our two study groups, the low sat target group, and this figure and all figures beyond will be represented in the blue, the high saturation target arm in the pink, and this is a density plot. So this shows you the proportion of infants with a median saturation at each of the various levels. As one would hope, the median saturations in the, in the low sat target group were lower than those of the infants in the high sat target group. Of course, once an infant weans to room air, you can't stop them from saturating 98, 99, 100%. So that explains sort of the broad, the broad um, uh, density plots here. 
This is our primary outcome. This is the number of intermittent hypoxemic events defined as a saturation less than 80% for at least 30 seconds per eight hours of monitoring time between 36 weeks postmenstrual age and six months corrected age. As you can appreciate, there is a tendency for infants in the low SAT target group to have more events until about maybe 48 weeks postmenstrual age than infants in the high SAT target group. At that point, the lines come together and overlap quite substantially. But even with that, our confidence intervals are wide, and there is not a statistically significant difference in the incidence of hypoxemia over the entire study period. Turning to our second way of looking at hypoxemia, the proportion of time that infants spend with an oxygen saturation less than 80%. Again, as you'll appreciate, infants randomized to the lower saturation arm of the trial tended to have oxygen saturations below 80% more often for the first few months. After that, again, the lines come together, overlap quite substantially. And over the entire study period, there is not a difference between the two groups. However, we did observe an inflection point around 48 weeks, so we repeated our analyses just looking at the, the period of time where the preponderance of the data lies, that is, between randomization and 48 weeks postmenstrual age. When looking at the data this wee way, there is, in fact, a higher incidence of intermittent hypoxemia among infants randomized to the low SAT target group. Infants in the high group had an average of about 1.2 events per eight hours. Those in the low group, about 2.2 events per eight hours. And this was highly significant. Similarly, when just looking through 48 weeks postmenstrual age, infants in the low SAT target group spent much more time with saturations below 80%. We had used many different definitions of intermittent hypoxemia in our secondary analyses because many different definitions have been used in the literature, and it still isn't known which events are the most important. So over the entire study period, when looking at longer events, the events longer than 60 seconds, which are the ones that have been shown to be significant in the COT data, those were more common in the low SAT target group over the entire study period. And when using a threshold of 90% 90 per, 90 for a definition of intermittent hypoxemia, no matter which duration you look at, events were more common in the low SAT target group. And then when using a cutoff, just looking up to 48 weeks postmenstrual age, no matter how you define intermittent hypoxemia, all events are more common if you randomize the ch child to the low SAT target arm. Similarly, using a threshold of 90% instead of 80% when defining hypoxemia, infants in the low SAT target group were much more likely to be spending time with saturations below the cutoff. Infants in the low SAT target arm of our trial also stayed in the hospital slightly longer, an average of three weeks longer, although they were equally likely to be discharged on respiratory support and there was no difference in resource utilization after discharge. We asked parents about health-related quality of life. Interestingly, among families whose children were randomized to the low SAT target arm, they were much more likely to say that they thought their child was less healthy than other children they knew, at least until three months. After that time point, we did not observe this difference. And we did not observe any differences in growth between the two arms of our study. Finally, looking at development, we use the Bailey Scales of Infant and Toddler Development Screening Tool. This tool evaluates five domains and scores infants as competent, emerging, or at risk in each of those five domains. As you can see in the second row of this table, infants in the low SAT target arm had a suggestion of more likely to be emerging or at risk in at least one domain of the Bailey screening tool at six months corrected age. 
I'll just change direction slightly and show you one other thing that we've learned so far in secondary analyses of our trial data. In our trial, we use the shortest averaging time and the shortest sampling time that is possible for an oximeter because we are interested in having the most granular data possible. Of course, when you use really short sampling times and really short averaging times, it's really easy to trigger an alarm. Very often, people will use short averaging and sampling times when they discharge patients from the hospital on a monitor. People often, also often use high cutoffs to trigger alarms. So at our hospital, the traditional approach is to use a cutoff of 90% to trigger, trigger an alarm among uh, children who are discharged on supplemental oxygen with home monitoring. People also tend to not program oximeters with delays, with alarm delays, which means as soon as the infant falls below that threshold, the alarm will go off. We hypothesized that this is extremely bothersome for families and probably leads to a lot of alarm fatigue at the home. And so we were interested in exploring the impact of different settings, different averaging times, different alarm delays on alarm incidents in our infants who are monitored at home. So we were able to take advantage of our trial data. We used data from 20 patients who had been discharged on home monitors. 10 of them were in room air and 10 of them on cannulas. And we, um, we, uh, we evaluated the first month's worth of data to look at the average number of alarms a family would be dealing with at home. So using an eight second averaging time and a cutoff of 90% and no delay, the average family would be experiencing 22 alarms every night in an eight hour night. So you can imagine if you're trying to sleep for eight hours and the alarm goes off 22 times, you're not gonna get much sleep. But if you lower your cutoff to 80% and only trigger an alarm if the child has, falls below a threshold of 80%, and you wait until they've been below 80% for 15 seconds, now you'll only have one alarm per night. And probably we don't need to respond every single time the infant goes below 90% for one second, but we certainly should be responding when the infant goes below 80% for 15 seconds. And so just by changing the settings on the monitor, we are able to separate out the events that really matter. So using these trial data, we hope that this is potentially a very clinically useful piece of information that can inform patient care today. So in conclusion, this trial is actually the first trial to compare saturation target ranges after discharge in preterm infants with established BPD. We've established that real-time oxygen saturation monitoring in these patients is feasible. We've established that hypoxemia is common and continues at least until 48 weeks postmenstrual age. We now know that targeting a higher oxygen saturation range will significantly decrease the incidence of hypoxemia in these infants. And certainly, additional trials of oxygen management are going to be essential for optimizing the care and the outcomes of our babies with BPD. So I will just mention this study was funded by the Thrasher Research Fund. They were exceptionally patient when it was a very slow trial during COVID. Um, they were a great team to work with and uh, our study participants were amazing. This was a huge effort for them as well as us, and they were really fun to work with. And I can't wait for your questions. Thank you, Dr. DeMario. Okay, Dr. Seredar, if we can go to the stage for uh, question and answer session. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, we have a question. I think Dr. Dua. Um, thank you for a very nice uh, and excellent session, Dr. Uh, Taisir. My question first to uh, Dr. Sarah. Can I ask you about the saturation target in your uh, unit after 30, at 36 weeks and after for those babies who has been labeled as PPD patients? 
Yes, thank you for the question. So our saturation limit is 91% in those infants. Um, uh, the saturation target arms for our trial were developed through a consensus process with the neonatologists and the pulmonologists at our hospital. Uh, most people allow infants with BPD, established BPD as they reach term corrected age to have higher saturations than one would with an extremely preterm infant who's much earlier in their postnatal life. So that's how we came to those, to those targets. Uh, my second question, Dr. Saridar, what is the role of uh, family integrated care for uh, ventilated patients, especially in uh, UAE community and culture? Thank you. I, think, uh, I mean, Dr. Sarah had illustrated the early mobilization of the babies and that goes with it. Most of us are a bit hesitant to take out the babies for skin to skin care when they're intubated, especially in the first few days. But it's a partnership, as she said, with the nursing team, and we have to break that barrier, I think, gradually. Australia, I think they are doing, even in the, once you're part, I mean, past the first three days for the IVH prevention part, they start doing it early. At, it's uh, also related to the team, how many experienced members of the team. Uh, so we need to start that as well. Thank you. Just I have one comment uh, for Dr. Sara, if it's okay. Uh, the in very interesting results, and I think... It goes to show that it's not just the oxygen, it's also the FRC maintenance. So probably you need to select a cohort of babies who need a little pressure as well when they go home. And I know a high flow device, for example, may be a little costlier, but you're saving on the hospital stay. And to have less than 80% saturation for more than 30 seconds at home is really scary. So you really need to pick the patients carefully. And this is probably going to be the output from your study, right? That we don't need just oxygen, we need some pressure as well in the BPD babies who are almost ready, but when they have a small reflex, for example, they are dropping their FRC, so the oxygen is dropping. Would you agree with that? Yes, I completely agree that. I, th I think often in our eagerness to get babies out of the hospital, we wean the pressures too quickly, um, and I think very often infants benefit more from pressure than they do from oxygen. Thank you. All right, Dr. Faisal. Uh, thank you very much. Sarah, just was going to ask you about the two groups, the one you had really the higher saturation and the lower. I did see there was sl more, slightly more babies in the lower group who are invasively ventilated. I think it was 14 to 18, I think, percent. Yes. So, so my question is that, did you take into account they may have a longer period of uh, hypoxemia because of you know, intervention like suction and other things. Because these kids, as you know yourself, there is tendency, our RTs and ourselves actually, seem to be a baby ventilated who has in regular suction, seem to be okay for them to be low. Wait, no, it's okay, they will come up, leave it alone. But when a baby is non-invasive, it's different. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, I, I should have been more clear, so while there was um, there were a, fewer than 20% of, of infants in the trial overall were intubated at 36 weeks. We actually did not put them on a study monitor until they were extubated. Because really the goal of this trial was to understand how we manage oxygen in infants with established BPD who are weaning and on a trajectory and a pathway towards home um, and through that discharge and, and post-discharge. So we waited till they were extubated to put them on the study monitor. I completely agree that patterns of hypoxemia in intubated infants are very different from, from after extubation. Thank you. Yeah. Doctor? Uh, hello. I'm, I'm Dr. Shabir. I have recently joined at Bujila Hospital Abu Dhabi. I have a, a query regarding the humidification. Uh, in the humidifier, there are two modes, right? Uh, invasive and non-invasive mode. So uh, for non-invasive ventilation neonates like a CPAP and HFNC, which mode of humidifier you have to select? Actually, very good question. Thank you, Dr. Shabir, and welcome to UAE. Uh, I would like to clarify a little more on the humidity concept as well and what I meant uh, when I was discussing that because the slide didn't project as well. So we have absolute humidity and relative humidity and the amount of water vapor that the, uh, I mean, uh, that can be carried depends on your temperature. Suppose you have a temperature of 40 degrees, you may be able to carry 46 milligrams, if you have a temperature of 37, you may carry 36 to 44. And in a ventilated baby, we need at least 33 milligrams uh, to be carried in the water vapor to be adequate. In a baby on CPAP or high flow, for example, we need at least 22 to 24 
You don't need 33, but if you have 33, it saves the baby's effort. Suppose the baby is having to consume energy because the reason CPAP or NIV has less is because part of the nasal humidification mechanism is protected. But this is an energy expensive process. The baby is using the blood flow. The heating up of the gas happens at the nose. If it's already coming with adequate humidity, it's just the heating that is needing to be maintained. So we have tried using the invasive setting for humidification for the tiny babies as well, the uh, extreme low birth weight babies especially in the first few days. But unless you have the right circuit, you may find problems with condensate. Uh, because the temperature drops and the condensation happens. And the reason we want to keep the heater wire probe outside the incubator is if it starts sensing as uh, the temperature at the heater and wire is 34, uh, it doesn't, uh, I mean, carry as much water vapor as uh, it should uh, because it allows for the drop, the compensation. If the incubator temperature is 34 and the outside temperature is 28 or 26, then it heats up more so the actual water vapor content carried to the baby is adequate and condensation will not happen. So the heat conveyed is different. Uh, I hope this answers your question. So in the tiny babies, you can use an invasive setting for non-invasive if you have the right heated wire. But condensation is a problem. For, for example, the rain out may reach the nose of the baby and nursing becomes difficult. In those cases, you may have to use a non-invasive mode because the temperature limit is like 32 or 33 degrees. And relatively, the water vapor content will be lower than that. Of course, uh, nose of the baby can compensate. Yeah, it's clear now. Actually, the, in the FNP manual for humidification says that we can use invasive or non-invasive mode. I think so, uh, they do have, I mean, even fisher Packel, for example, they have the uh, double-walled uh, double uh, humidifier circuits, but they're more expensive. They will uh, evaporate the water content, so it doesn't condense. It doesn't stay in the circuit. So if you have that circuit, you can use, but uh, that's an additional expense for your unit. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Janai? Yeah. So thank you very much, uh, Sarita. Thank you very much, Sarah. I, I have a question, Sarah, for you. Uh, don't guess my age. When I did my fellowship, the oxygen saturation target is 88. And then the uh, Ola Sagastad study came that 90 to 94, and because of the mortality. But on the other hand, the BPD and ROP is high. So if the baby established BPD and it is still in the unit, do you agree to, uh, if the baby is maintaining saturation on room air 88 and above is fine, because the chances of the mortality part is gone almost, and, but the ROP is still there? Right, so once an infant has established BPD, the practice certainly in our institution has been to keep the saturation above 90, ideally above 91. There's a lot of concern about progression of BPD. Mm. Um, there's a lot of concern about um, progression of retinopathy and also evolution of pulmonary hypertension. And for all those reasons, mm. the, the sense has been that it's, it's optimal to be above mm. that. But once one gets above a threshold of 90 or 91, that's where, at least in our practice, that's where the question lies. And that, mm. that was the genesis of, of okay. the thresholds we tested. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Hi. Sal. Yeah. Oh, Let's go to this side. Yeah, in continuity yeah. with the same question, like context. So, uh, the, uh, as per the understanding of your study, at 36 weeks, we aim to have a higher uh, saturation for BPD because of the hypoxemia. Mm -hmm. uh, we know ROP has two different phases, like initial phase where there's hypoxemia, yes. and then the hypoxemia can cause more VEGF. That's why they require treatment around 32 to 34, 36 weeks. So, in that period, do you suggest having a higher target saturation will decrease the need of uh, like anti-VGF injections? Yes, that's, that's an excellent question. And there are certainly people who practice with a higher saturation target starting earlier, maybe around 32 weeks, um, because they think it's prote protective against progression of ROP. That has not yet been our practice in our hospital. Um, I think ultimately for all patients, avoidance of large swings is probably the most important thing for protection of the eyes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, for Dr. Sara, I have a question about the target saturation for uh, premature babies. For center who has a higher ROB, um, some they choose a little bit in between. That means they choose uh, mm -hmm. 89 to 91, 92 versus the standard 90 to 95. 
there's any study compared those two uh, parameters? There is not a trial that I'm aware of that compares those two parameters early in life with regard to impact on ROP. There are, there are trials, old trials, later in life to try and protect against evolution of ROP, um, but, but not early in life for protection against ROP. But, you know, certainly your local ROP rates would be a reasonable consideration when deciding what your local practice is with, with regard to oxygen saturation target ranges. And again, one of the things that we have learned from the early trials is that wide swings in oxygen saturation levels are at least as problematic as, as the, the range that you select. Thank you. Okay, that concludes our uh, respiratory session. I guess we have a little longer break. Uh, we'll need to come back at 11 uh, for the next session. 10.45? Okay, we'll go back uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the room, 10.45. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sarah and uh, Dr. Seridar. Thank you. Thank you to our distinguished speakers and our esteemed chair. Uh, as mentioned, we'll resume back at 10.45 a.m. And certificates for our speakers, Dr. Uh, Taisir Atrak. Dr. Sridhar. Thank you.